the chemises and assumption of our most holy lady the mother of god and ever virgin mary translated from the miniology of saint dimitri of rostov after the lord's achievement of the salvation of the human race and his ascension to heaven the most pure and most blessed virgin mary mother of god the mediatress of our salvation lived among the first christians for a considerable time she was filled with great spiritual joy at the sight of the spread of the church of christ throughout the whole universe and the extension to the ends of the earth of the glory of her son in the first days of the life of the christian church the most holy mother of god saw with her own eyes the fulfillment of her words that she would be blessed by all generations wherever christians glorified christ as god they also blessed his most pure mother who was then still living on the earth the most holy mother of god had reached an advanced age when she drew near to her most honorable and glorious domitian she herself wished to leave the body and go to god as soon as possible the one unceasing desire of her soul had always been to see the sweet face of her son sitting at the right hand of the father in heaven burning with incomparably greater love for him than the seraphim the mother of god shed copious tears from her holy eyes and fervently prayed to the lord to take from this veil of tears to the blessed abodes on high she lived in the house of saint john the divine on sion and she often went there to the mountain of olives and the place of the ascension to heaven of her son and our lord there she offered to him in solitude her fervent prayers once as she was praying alone on the mount of olives that the lord will quickly take her to himself to heaven there appeared before her the archangel gabriel who had served the most holy mother of god from her early childhood he had fed her in the holy of holies had announced to her the good news of the birth of her divine son and had constantly guarded her throughout her life on earth with a radiant face the celestial ambassador conveyed to the most holy mother of god the word of the lord that she was so glad to hear that soon after 3 days she would depart and be with christ in telling the immaculate virgin the hour of her death the archangel said that she would not be troubled but should receive his words with joy and she was being called to immortal life and to the eternal king of glory thy son and our god said the archangel with the angels and archangels cherubim and seraphim with all the heavenly spirits and with the souls of the righteous will receive you his mother into the heavenly kingdom that you may live and reign with him forever as a sign of the triumph of the ma- mother of god over death that is that bodily death would not have power over her just the spiritual death had had not dominion over her and that she would merely fall asleep for a short time and then as if waking from sleep would rise and shake off death like sleep from the eyes and would see in the light of the lord's face the immortal life and glory to which she would go with shouts of joy and spiritual happiness as a sign of all this the archangel handed the most holy virgin a branch from paradise this was a branch from a date palm and it shone with light of heavenly grace it was to be carried as the archangel said before the bed of the mother of god when her most honorable and most pure body was carried to burial the most blessed mother of god was filled with unspeakable joy and spiritual rapture for what could be more joyful and acceptable for her than life in heaven with her son and the happiness of contemplating his face falling on her knees she fervently thanked her creator i would not have been worthy prayed the most holy mother of god to receive you o lord in my womb unless you yourself had had mercy on me your slave 
I kept the treasure entrusted to me, and therefore I have the boldness to ask you, O King of Glory, to protect me from the power of Gena. If heaven and the angels tremble before you, how much more man made of the dust who has had nothing good of his own except what he has been given by your goodness. You, O Lord of God, blessed be forever. Before her departure from this life, the most holy, pure lady wanted to see the holy apostles who were already scattered all over the world for the preaching of the gospel. She prayed to the Lord that at the hour of her death she might not see the prince of darkness in his horrible and his horrible servants, but that her son and God himself would fulfill his promise and come and receive her soul into his holy hands. When Our Lady knelt and offered on the mountain of olives her petition and thanksgiving to her Creator, her prayer was accompanied by a wonderful manifestation. The olive trees growing on the mountain bowed with the Mother of God exactly as if they were animate. When the Mother of God knelt, the trees bent down. When she rose, the trees straightened themselves out again. The trees served the Holy Mother like slaves honouring her as the Mother of God. After finishing her prayer, the Most Holy Mother of God returned home and at once everything was shaken from the presence of an invisible power of God surrounding the Mother of God and from the glory of the Lord with which she was irradiated. Her face, which always shone with the grace of God more than the face of Moses, who once spoke with God on Sinai, became still more radiant with unspeakable glory. Our most blessed lady began to prepare for her death. First of all, she told the beloved disciple John, who had adopted her, about it and showed him the flowering branch of paradise and told him to carry it before her bed. Then the most holy virgin told the rest of her household about it. Afterwards, she ordered her apartment to be sprinkled with perfume and as many lamps as possible to be lit in it and that her room and her bed should be decorated. In a word, that all necessary preparations for her burial should be made. St. John the Divine at once sent to St. James the Lord's brother and first bishop of Jerusalem and also to all the relatives and neighbours informing them of the imminent decease of the Mother of God. St. James at once informed all the Christians, not only those living in Jerusalem, but those in the surrounding towns and villages, so that with the Bishop of Jerusalem they gathered to the Most Holy Mother of God all her relatives and a great multitude of the faithful. In the hearing of all, the Immaculate Lady told all who had gathered there the message brought to her by the Archangel about her translation to heaven, and in confirmation showed them the branch of paradise which, like a ray of the sun, shone with the light of heavenly glory. On hearing from the lips of the Mother of God herself the news of her speedy end, the faithful around her could not restrain their tears. The whole house was filled with weeping and lamentation. All implored the merciful lady as the common mother of all not to leave them orphans. But the Mother of God asked them not to weep but to rejoice at her death, as by standing nearer to the throne of God and gazing face to face on her Son and God and conversing with Him mouth to mouth, she would be able to pray to Him with greater boldness after her death. Moreover, the Most Blessed Mother of God promised not to leave them orphans after her departure, but that she would visit the whole world and attend to its needs and help those in trouble. The comforting words of the Mother of God dried the tears of those who were weeping and consoled their sorrow. Our most pure lady then made a will regarding her two garments, that they should be given to two poor widows who had faithfully served her and received their maintenance from her. With regard to her most pure body, the Mother of God made her will 
that it should be buried in the Mount of Olives, not far from Jerusalem, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where was the tomb of her righteous parents, Joachim and Anna, and that of her spouse, Saint Joseph. These tombs lay in the valley of Josephat between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, which was the common burial ground for the poor inhabitants of Jerusalem. While the Most Holy Mother of God was making these arrangements, all of a sudden a noise was heard similar to a clap of thunder, and a cloud encircled the house of St. John the Divine. By the command of God, angels seized the apostles who were scattered to the ends of the world for the preaching of the gospel and brought them on clouds to Jerusalem and placed them on Sion before the door of the house where the Mother of God dwelt. On seeing one another, the holy apostles rejoiced, but at the same time wondered, saying, Why has the Lord gathered, gathered us together? Saint John the Divine went out to them and greeted them with joyful tears and told them of the speedy departure of the Most Holy Mother of God. Then the holy disciples said that the Lord had gathered them from the various parts of the world to be present at the blessed end of His Immaculate Mother, so that her pure body could be buried with honour. The news of the speedy departure of the Mother of God filled the hearts of the holy apostles with intense sorrow. Going into the house, they saw the Mother of God with a joyful countenance, sitting on her bed. The holy apostles greeted her with the words, Blessed are you of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Peace to you, brethren, chosen by the Lord himself, the Immaculate Lady replied. Then she asked, How did you arrive here? The holy apostles revealed to her how each of them had been caught up by the power of the Spirit of God from the place of his preaching and brought to Sion on the cloud. The Mother of God glorified God, who had heard her prayer and fulfilled the desire of her heart to see the holy apostles at the hour of her death. The Lord, she said, addressing them, has brought you here for the consolation of my soul, which, is, which as our mortal nature demands, is soon to be separated from the body. Already the time appointed for me by my Creator is at hand. In reply they said to her with sorrow, During your life on earth, lady, we were consoled by gazing at you as at, the, as at our Lord and Master himself. But now deprived of your presence, how shall we bear the heavy sorrow that wraps, wraps our souls? But now by the will of him who was born of you, Christ God, you are going away to the heavenly abodes, and it is impossible for us not to rejoice at the decision of God regarding you, though at the same time we cannot refrain from weeping, that we are to be left orphans, for we shall no longer see you our mother and comforter. At these words the holy apostles wept. Do not weep, the most holy mother of God comforted them friends and disciples of Christ, and do not darken my joy by your sorrow, but rather rejoice with me, for I am going away to my Son and God. My body, which I have myself prepared for burial, commit to the earth in Gethsemane, and then return again to the preaching of the gospel appointed to you. And if the Lord wills, you will see me after my departure. During this conversation, the Mother of God with the holy apostles, the chosen vessel arrived, the holy apostle Paul. Falling at the feet of the most holy mother of God, he opened his mouth, praising and blessing her. Rejoice, said the holy apostle, mother of my life and my preaching. If before the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ I was not able to enjoy the sight of his fa face here on earth, Yet gazing now on you, I think that I see him. With the Apostle Paul were also his close disciples, Dionysius, the Areopagite, Hierotheos, and Timothy. There were also present the rest of the seventy apostles, 
all were gathered together by the Holy Spirit in order to be granted the blessing of the Immaculate Virgin Mary and to increase by their presence the solemnity of her burial. The Immaculate Lady called each of the Holy Apostles to herself by name and praised their faith and labours in the preaching of Jesus Christ. To each one she wished, wished eternal beatitude and she prayed for the peace of the whole world. The fifteenth day of the month of August came and the blessed hour that all were awaiting drew near, the departure of the Most Holy Mother of God. It was the third hour of the day. In the room, a number of lamps were burning. The holy apostles were offering praise to God. The Immaculate Virgin was lying on a beautifully adorned bed, preparing herself for her blessed end and waiting for her beloved Son and Lord to come to her. Suddenly, there shone in the room an ineffable light of divine glory, which dimmed the lamps. Those to whom this vision was granted were awestruck. They saw the roof of the apartment opened and the glory of the Lord descending from heaven. Christ, the King of glory himself, with hosts of angels and archangels, with all the heavenly powers, with the holy fathers and prophets, who of old prophesied about the Holy Virgin and all the righteous souls, approached his Immaculate Mother. At the sight of the approach of her son, the Mother of God cried with a great joy the words of her song, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he has regarded the humility of his handmaiden. And raising herself, from her bed, as if she were trying to go to meet her son, she worshipped the Lord looking at her with love and said, and he said, Come, my near one, come, my dove, come, my precious treasure, and enter into the abodes of eternal life. Bowing, the mother of God replied, Blessed is your name, O Lord of glory, and my God, it was pleased to choose your humble servant for the service of your mystery. Remember me, O King of glory, in your eternal kingdom. You know that I have loved you with all my heart and have kept the treasure entrusted to me. And now receive my soul in peace and defend me from all the snares of the dark power of Satan. The Lord consoled her with words full of love and persuaded her not to fear the power of Satan which was already conquered by her. He called her with love to pass fearlessly from earth to heaven. My heart is ready, O God, my heart is ready, the Holy Virgin replied. Then repeating the words once said by her before, Let it be to me according to your word. She again lay down on the bed feeling unspeakable joy at the sight of the radiant face of her son and lord the mother of god surrendered her pure soul into the hands of the lord filled with spiritual rapture out of love for him she felt no pain whatever but it was as if she fell into a sweet sleep he whom she conceived without destroying her virginity and bore without pain received her soul from her pure body and at once there began wonderful angelic singing, filled with joy, in which were heard frequently repeated by the angels the words of Gabriel's greeting to the Holy Virgin. Rejoice, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. With such triumphant songs the heavenly hosts accompanied the holy soul of the Mother of God, as she went in the arms of the Lord to the dwellings above. The holy apostles, who were granted this vision, followed the Mother of God with tender eyes, as once they had followed the Lord when he ascended from the Mount of Olives. For a long time they stood aghast as if they were in a swoon. When they came to themselves, the disciples worshipped the Lord, whom had raised his mother's soul to heaven with glory, and they surrendered her bed with weeping. The face 
of the most blessed Virgin Mary shone like the sun in a wonderful perfume such as it is impossible to find here on earth came from her most pure body. All the faithful reverently venerated her most pure body and kissed it with awe. From the precious relics of the Mother of God there went out sanctifying power which filled with joy the hearts of all who touched her. The sick received healing, the blind regained their sight, the ears of the deaf, deaf were opened, the lame were made to walk, devils were driven out, every disease vanished completely merely from touching the bed of the Mother of God. In the midst of these events, which accompanied the death of the Mother of God, there began the solemn procession for the burial of the most honourable body. Standing at the head, the holy apostle Peter, with the holy apostles Paul and James, the Lord's brother, lifted the bed of the most holy mother of God with the other holy apostles of the number of the twelve, while Saint John the Divine carried in front the branch of paradise which gave out a radiance. The rest of the faithful, with lights and senses, walked close by, surrounding the bed, all sang the funeral hit prayers. The Holy Apostle Peter began, and the rest sang in harmony after him the Psalm of David at the exodus of Israel from Egypt, adding to each verse, Alleluia. According to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, others also sang prayers and psalms of triumphant and thanksgiving. The solemn procession, with the most pure body of the Mother of God, went from Sion through Jerusalem to Gethsemane. Above the bed and those accompanying it there appeared a circular cloud reminiscent of a crown which shone like a bright radiance. And in the cloud, in the hearing of all filling the air, there resounded wonderful angelic singing. This crown of cloud floated through the air above the bed of the Mother of God to the actual place of burial, and all this time the angelic singing never stopped. But the joyful procession, the feeble human tongue cannot describe it, was unexpectedly interrupted. Many of the Jews who did not believe in Christ, on hearing the unusual singing and seeing the triumphant procession, left their homes to, and joined it. They also followed it out of the city, astonished at the glory and honour which was given to the most honourable body of the Mother of Jesus Christ. When the chief priests and scribes learnt of this, they were furious. They stirred up many of the people, and they sent servants and soldiers to overtake the procession and disperse it. They also ordered them to kill the disciples of Christ and to burn the body of the Mother of God. But when the mob that obeyed the instigators, arming itself for battle, ran furiously after those who were accompanying the body of the Most Holy Mother of God and began to catch, up, catch them up, suddenly the circle of cloud that was floating in the air came down to the earth and surrounded the Holy Apostles and the rest of the Christians exactly like a wall. The pursuers only heard singing but could see no one behind the cloud. The holy angels flying invisibly over the body of the Mother of God and the Christians struck the malicious persecutors with blindness. Some bashed their heads against the city walls, others not knowing where to go looked for guides. At that time, a Jewish priest called Athan happened to go out on the road. Seeing the holy apostles, the cloud by the command of God for the greater glory of the Mother of God again lifted, and a multitude of Christians with lights and singing surrounded the body of the ever-Virgin Mary, Athen was filled with envy. There flashed out in him the former malice against our Lord, and he said, Look what honour surrounds the body of her who bore the imposter, who destroyed the law of our fathers. Being very strong, he rushed with mad fury through the crowd of Christians to the bed in order to throw the body of our Immaculate Lady to the ground. When the audacious hands of the priest touched the bed, an invisible angel at once 
cut them off at the elbows with the immaterial sword of the divine vengeance. And they hung, stuck fast to the bed, while Athan fell to the earth crying, Woe is me! Realizing his sin, he repented and said to the holy apostles, Have mercy on me, servants of Christ. The holy apostle Peter ordered those who were carrying the body of the mother of God to stop, and he said to Athan, Now you have got what you wanted. Know that God, the Lord of vengeance, has revealed himself, and we cannot heal you of your wounds. Only our Lord himself can do this, whom you unjustly rose up against, seized and killed. But even he will not want to give you healing until you believe in him with all your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the true Messiah, the Son of God. I believe, cried Athan, that he is the Saviour of the world foretold by the prophets, the Christ. From the very first we saw that he was the Son of God, but being darkened by malicious envy, we did not acknowledge the greatness of God openly and delivered him to death when he was guiltless. But by the power of his divinity, he rose on the third day, putting us all to shame. We tried to hide his resurrection by bribing the guard, but we could do nothing as the glory of the resurrection spread everywhere. When Athan said this and repented of his sin, the holy apostles and all the faithful rejoiced with the joy of the angels over a penitent sinner. The holy apostle Peter ordered Athan to put the wounds of his severed arms to the parts hanging on the bed and to call upon the most holy mother of God with to their places and become perfectly well. There remained only faith. Athan did this, and at once the severed arms were joined to the mark of the amputation. Just a red line around the elbows, Athan fell down before the bed, worshipping him who was born of the Most Holy Mother of God, Christ, our God, and blessing with many praises his Immaculate Mother. He quoted from the Holy Scripture the prophecies which testified both to her and to Christ, and all were doubly amazed at seeing the miraculous healing of Athan's amputated arms and at hearing from him the wise words with which he glorified the Lord Jesus and praised the Mother of God. Then Athan joined the holy apostles following behind the bed with the other Christians to Gethsemane. In exactly the same way, of the people who had been struck with blindness, those received healing who acknowledged their sin and penitently went up to the honourable bed and touched it with faith, they regained the sight not only of their body, bodily eyes, but also of the eyes of their soul. The merciful Mother of all, our most holy Lady, as by her birth she had given joy to the whole world, so at her assumption she did not wish to sadden anyone. As the mother of God and the good King, she mercifully consoled with her gracious gifts even those who were her enemies. At last the holy apostles with all the multitude of the Christians reached the garden of Gethsemane. When they put down the bed with the most precious body, again there arose weeping among the Christians. At the loss of such a treasure, all bewailed their orphanhood in giving the last kiss the Christians fell down before the body of the Most Holy Mother of God and kissed it, shedding tears, so that only towards evening could the Most Honourable Body be placed in the tomb. But even when an enormous stone had been rolled to the mouth of the tomb, the people did not want to leave it, held by love for the Mother of God. The Holy Apostles stayed by the tomb, of the Most Holy Mother of God without leaving the Garden of Gethsemane for three full days, singing psalms day and night. During all this time, there was heard in the air the wonderful singing of the heavenly hosts praising God and blessing His Immaculate Mother. By God's special arrangement, one of the Apostles, St. Thomas, was not present at the most glorious burial of the body of the Immaculate Mother of God. 
he arrived in Gethsemane only on the third day. The Holy Apostle Thomas was intensely sorry and grave that he was not granted the last greeting and blessing of the Immaculate Mother of God like the rest of the Holy Apostles. He wept violently also because he was the only one who did not see the divine glory, the wonderful mysteries and the works of God manifested at the time of the death and solemn burial of the Mother of God. Taking pity on him, the Apostles decided to open the tomb so that St. Thomas might at least see the dead body of the Blessed Mother of God, worship it and kiss it, and thus get some relief from his sorrow and consolation in his grief. But when the Holy Apostles rolled away the stone and opened the tomb, they were aghast. The body of the Mother of God was not in the tomb. All that remained were the burial clothes which diffused a wonderful fragrance. The holy apostles stood in amazement, wondering what it meant. With tears and reverence, they kissed the burial clothes which were lying in the tomb and prayed to the Lord that he would reveal to them where the body of the most holy mother of God had disappeared to. Towards the evening, they sat down in order to refresh themselves with a little food. During meals, the holy apostles had the following custom. They left one place unoccupied, putting a piece of bread in the empty place in honour of Christ as his portion. After finishing the meal and offering thanks, they took this piece of bread, called the Lord's portion, and lifted it up, glorifying the great name of the Most Holy Trinity. Then after the words, Lord Jesus Christ help us, they used to eat this piece as a blessing from God. The holy apostles did this not only when they were together, but even when they were far from one another. And now in Gethsemane, during the meal, they spoke and thought of nothing but why the most pure body of the Mother of God was not in the tomb. But after the meal, when the holy apostles began to lift up the portion of bread put aside in honour of the Lord, glorifying the Most Holy Trinity, suddenly they heard angelic singing. Raising their eyes, they saw standing in the air the Immaculate Mother of God, surrounded by a multitude of angels. She was suffused with an ineffable light, and she said to them, Rejoice, for I am with you all the days. Filled with joy instead of the usual, Lord Jesus Christ, help us. The holy apostles cried, Most holy Mother of God, help us. From that time they taught the Holy Church to believe that the Immaculate Mother of God on the third day after her burial was raised by her son and taken with her body to heaven. Going again to the tomb, the holy apostles took the shroud for the consolation of the sorrowful and as the authentic evidence of the rising of the Mother of God from the tomb. It would not have been fitting for the Shrine of Life to be in the tomb of death and for her who gave birth to the Creator to partake of corruption with earthly creatures. The Lawgiver proved the door of the law given by him that sons should honour their parents. He gave his Immaculate Mother the same honour as himself, just as he himself had risen with glory on the third day and afterwards ascended with his pure flesh to heaven. So he raised his Mother with glory on the third day and took her to himself to the heavenly dwellings. The holy prophet David foresaw this when he said, Arise, O Lord, into your resting place. You are the ark of your sanctuary. His prophetic words were fulfilled at the resurrection of the Lord and the raising by him of his mother. The empty rock-hewn tomb of the mother of God like her sons has been preserved till now and serves as an object of reverent veneration for the faithful. The Lord by his special providence delayed the arrival of St. Thomas until the day of the falling asleep of the mother of God so that the tomb might be opened for him, and so that the church in this way might believe in the resurrection of the Mother of God 
just as previously, through the same apostle's unbelief, the church had come to believe in the resurrection of Christ. Thus were accomplished the falling asleep of her most pure and blessed lady, the mother of God, the burial of her undefiled body, her glorious resurrection, and the triumphant assurance regarding her ascension to heaven in the flesh. After all these wonderful miracles and mysteries of God, the holy apostles, again born on a cloud, returned each to his own country from which he had taken, been taken during his preaching of the gospel. You gave birth yet preserved your virginity. You fell asleep in death yet did not desert the world, O Theodorus. You were transported to life as you are the mother of life and by virtue of your intercessions deliver our souls from death. And Dionysit in Barthania Nephilaxas, and Dikimisit on Cosmonucaten Ipesteotokem, Metes tis prostin zoin, Mitiri parhusa tis zois, Ketes presvies teses nitrumeni, Ekthanatu tas